Morning, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Great to see you all. For those who do not know me yet, my name is Ron Levine from Mindfulness in Blue Jeans. I've been practicing mindfulness and insight meditation for 25 years in April. And I was introduced to the practice during a time when I was dealing with clinical anxiety and depression and panic disorder. And my panic disorder had gotten bad enough I was suffering from agoraphobia. So I was unable to leave the house. I was on disability from work and happened to get paired up with a psychologist who was already several decades deep into practicing and teaching mindfulness and insight meditation, even back in the 90s before it became a flavor of the month. And this is what he offered me as a way of dealing with what I was going through. And I was not impressed with his suggestion. I couldn't work. I couldn't be social. I couldn't go to the damn corner store. And here's this guy talking about watching the breathing and stuff. I'm like, huh? The hell am I supposed to do with this? And he didn't give me anything else at first. And I was sitting at home panicking all day anyway. And I figured, all right, I'll give this an honest shot just long enough. I can go back to him and say, look, dude, this didn't work. Can I have the real treatment now, please? And I've never had that conversation with him. And I'm still practicing. I'm teaching. It's worked out for me pretty well. And uh, I'm going to... I'm going to stick with it a little while longer, maybe. Just as long as it keeps working. So thank you for being with me today. The freaking gall of some people. Huh? Right? I first gave this session. Actually, this is only only the second time I've done it. I think. The first time that I did it was... Right around the time the pandemic started, and I remember that because this session came out of an interaction that I had with a couple of new friends that we were out with just before the lockdown happened. And these were folks that we'd only seen like one time previous, a very new friendship forming. And at one point during the conversation, I asked one of them, A fairly innocuous question, nothing politically related, for example, Uh, and received a surprisingly sarcastic response that I found kind of rude. And I was really taken aback by that. It felt like I was being attacked. And... One of the benefits and one of the points, really, of engaging in a mindfulness insight meditation practice is we begin to be able to watch our internal processes, our reactions and our responses as they unfold to things in real time. And that was something that I did in that moment. I'm not always able to do that. I'm still getting better at it myself, right? still a work in progress. But at this particular time, that is something that I caught just as it was starting to unfold and watched the process as it did. And the first thing that I noticed was this initial surprise. Like, the hell just happened here, right? And then it feels like the very next thing that comes up is anger. Some form of anger. Indignation, right? You can't talk to me like that. Who the hell do you think you are? Right? But I've been working with this practice long enough to know that almost invariably, anger is really just this hard protective shell around fear. Some kind of fear. And the fear in this case was, well, geez, they're getting away with it. They just talk to me like that, unbidden. And they're getting away with it. Which, well, geez, I mean, that might mean people can think it's okay. Right, And we start to self 
around this. Yeah, using self as a verb. We start to self around it. We start building this self. We start selfing. And this anger, this angry energy, usually will either be expressed in terms of an outward counter strike or something that we direct inward is kind of this simmering rage. And we start to develop these storylines of inner offense and defense, right? We start picturing all the things that we could say, that we should say. And we just continue to bolster this sense of self around it. And we stick with that anger. Because, well, it feels better than the fear that it's protecting, right? This is one of the things that we want to notice about these processes, not just which processes unfold, but which ones we latch onto and why. If there's a fear process and an anger process, well, we usually latch onto the anger one. Feels better. More powerful, less scary, less vulnerable, right? So in this case, I deliberately didn't do that. I turned away from that and I turned towards the fear. And rather than getting caught up in these angry storylines of offense and defense, I listened to the fearful writer of the storylines, right? which of course is me, and listened to this frantic conversation that the fear voice was having. And what the fear voice was trying to figure out was, well, what do I have to do to regain this comfortable sense of self that I had before receiving this perceived threat to it. And I just kind of sat with that for a moment. And this space started to open up a little bit, and I didn't get an answer to that question, but a second question did arise. And the question that arose was, and I hadn't, I wasn't really expecting this, it seemed like a fairly obvious question in a way. It was not one I expected to arise. But the question that arose was, if the roles had been reversed in this conversation, what would I have done or said differently? That's just the question that came up. And that's when things really started to break apart, to loosen. Because I saw myself engaging in this interaction from the other side and responding in a way that I felt was, you know, reasonable. And I saw this in my mind juxtaposed with the reaction that I felt I had received. And I realized that the question that I was really asking was, would I have handled this interaction in a way that I feel is in tune with my own inner moral compass, right? And the immediate answer was, well, yeah. Yeah. And in that moment, I just kind of realized, I was like, well, what the hell else do I want? <laughs> You know, we, we talk about, oh, you know, clean out your own house and so forth. I'm like, well, geez, in this particular situation, I think my house is pretty clean. I'm not sure what else I could do to make it cleaner, really. And that's really, that's really all I've got here. And in that moment, this sense of self that I was so initially concerned with protecting just kind of dropped away it was kind of funny once i once i found this sense of self or a lack of sense of self that couldn't be threatened i ironically found i no longer needed it 
Now, this was the the story that I based this talk around a couple of years ago. And when I went back and reviewed it for today, I'm reading through it. I'm like, yeah, this did all happen this way. But going back, reading it two, three years later, having had that distance now of time and emotion or whatever, I realized it It sounds very, I mean, it sounds nice, but it sounds very theoretical. This is really one of those things where if we just talk about it, if we just read about it, yeah, it's very theoretical. It's on paper. Maybe it makes some sense. Maybe it sounds lovely, but that's not really where the shift happens. You know, sometimes people say, oh, you had to be there. This is something where, you know, you had to be there. You have to experience it at a felt level. So I wasn't logically thinking through these steps that I just talked about. It's just a straightforward description of a felt sense, a felt experience that I was going through. And something funny happened this week. As often happens when I schedule these things, the universe has this way of bringing things that are in line with whatever topic I'm planning on discussing. And that happened again this week. So around the time that I was noticing this theoretical versus felt aspect, I had someone, so I have a YouTube channel, some of you know about, I'll post a link to it in the chat later. My most recent addition to the YouTube channel, which I think I put out last weekend, somebody this past week, apparently they didn't like my latest offering (laughs) and posted a rather nasty message on it. And it was interesting that with this topic coming up, suddenly I did have an opportunity to freshly experience this sort of thing at a felt sense again. It's like, oh, well, shit. (laughs) Here we are again, right? And what was really interesting about it this time was now that I had, and certainly this wasn't the first time in the last three years I've had an opportunity to work with this, but this particular time, it brought to mind a session that I did, uh, I think about a month ago on one of my insight timer sessions where I was talking about this practice that I do sometimes based on loose ends. And I'll clarify what I mean by that in a moment. So I was noticing, as we often do, that in response to this diatribe I'd received, that, well, geez, there's the storyline starting, right? There's this this replaying over and over again of what this person wrote, storylines about, well, who the hell are you? And, well, you can't say that to me, and I do this, and I do that, and what the fuck, and, you know, all kinds of shit, right? And noticing the, the rumination about, well, what do I do in response? What do I say? And I'm watching these processes of storylining and rumination. And I'm like, all right, so this isn't pleasant, but I'm still doing it. So as we often ask in this practice, well, what's my motivation? What's my intention? Why am I engaging in this unpleasant process repeatedly? knowing it's unpleasant. And as I often say, when we catch ourselves overthinking, overthinking is almost invariably a sign that we're trying not to feel something. And in this case, not unlike the instance from a few years ago, what are we trying not to feel? Well, there's a feeling of discomfort 
as we experience a disillusionment around our lack of control. I can't control if someone gives me a nasty, sarcastic response in a conversation. I can't control, I mean, I technically could control whether people can leave comments on my YouTube channel, but we can't control what other people are going to say or do. And sometimes we like to cling to this notion that we get, you can't say that to me. Well, they just did. Oops. (laughs) So this brings me to the loose ends. And this comes from Tanisaru Bhikkhu, the monk that I often quote and probably will before the end of this session. He has this practice around noticing, and we're going to go through this today, not coincidentally. He has this practice around noticing how when storylines, thinking, comes up during our practice. These are like threads that we have a tendency to follow. And we always feel like we have to follow it to the end. It's like, okay, let me just finish this thought and get that sorted. Then I'll come back to my my breathing, right? And he says, no, you don't have to. You don't have to tie up every loose end. And in fact, there's a hell of a lot to be learned about seeing what the mind does when we don't give in to that desire, that need. And I realized that, well, that's the motivation for this overthinking, this rumination. I'm trying to tie up this loose end that's dangling out there in the breeze. Hey, somebody said this shit to me. What the fuck? You can't do that. I got to take care of this. All right. Holy shit. Somebody's being wrong on the internet. I got to fix that. (laughs) You know, one of the things I talk about a lot in this practice is how we think we're seeking happiness, but what we actually are seeking is comfort. We prioritize comfort over happiness and wonder why we're stuck. So in this case, what's my motivation? Well, I'm trying to seek the comfort of resolution, a satisfactory resolution rather than engaging in the true happiness that would come from release. Noticing, oh, wait a minute. No, I don't have to chase that to some logical conclusion. And I can open to, again, the felt sense of what it's like to let someone be wrong on the internet. To not follow every thread down its proverbial rabbit hole. Not accept every invitation to a fight I receive. What's that old thing about um, choose your battles? And then it's like, oh no, don't don't take so many battles. That's too many. Put some back. <laughs> right? And what I experienced by opening up to the felt sense of this perceived threat, I found that the discomfort was gone after I did that because the discomfort that I was really experiencing was coming from an attempt to not feel the discomfort. (laughs) It was so circular. So... Once I just said, no, no, wait a minute, let me, let me feel this. And once you've gone through the feeling, well, you don't have to worry about feeling it anymore. And then there's just kind of nothing left. Well, you know, I'm kind of lying, actually. There is something left. There is something left. What came up after that was gratitude. Because... I wouldn't have had 
a chance to experience or maybe re-experience this insight. Without somebody leaving a nasty message on a YouTube channel, right? It was a teaching moment. But it was a teaching moment because of how I handled it. So somebody acted in a way that was, well, the freaking gall, right? People are going to have gall. Sometimes we're going to have gall. Sometimes it's going to appear to other people like we have gall when we don't think we have gall. Vice versa, right? What matters is what we're doing with it. I could have turned that into, you know, a nuclear incident. And took it as a teaching moment. And these are very... What I'm, what I'm talking about here, of course, are extremely minor examples, Right? are really minor examples. Nobody's getting physically threatened or assaulted, you know, incredibly minor examples. But like so many things in this practice, it scales. We have these same options and techniques available to us in all kinds of situations. The point is that we are shifting our focus from trying to figure out how to change other people's behavior to skillfully working out how to best handle others' behavior, right? There's that old saying about, think about how hard it is to change yourself. What makes you think you're going to be able to change somebody else, right? So where are we placing our focus? Someplace where we do have some control or someplace where, well, we really don't. And in fact, it's the seeing that we don't that kind of set us off in the first place. Well, you can't act like that. Well, you did. Now what are you going to do with it? So this isn't to say that we don't act. This isn't to say that we don't respond when appropriate, if appropriate. It's when we do respond, if we respond, we're doing it from a better place, a place of clear seeing. So in my case... I just deleted the dude's comment. So, don't go looking for it. (laughs) The point is we are ultimately each responsible just for ourselves, right? For better or for worse. And the more I practice, I find it's for the better. We're each responsible for our own actions and our own intentions behind them. Those actions include thought and speech. Those are actions. This is karma. And we only really got our own. Can only really change our own. And part of that, and this is a really, this is, (laughs) this is a critical point. And in fact, is one of the most difficult points, at least for me. And part of our karma is this. Part of our experience is this. It's not enough to be skillful enough to be right. It's not enough to be skillful enough to be right. We also need to be able to handle our perceived rightness skillfully. Because it itself, if we do not handle it skillfully becomes a cause for our own suffering. This is what we're here to really do, is to release ourselves from our own suffering. So, even if we are completely right and the other person is completely wrong, if we don't handle our rightness skillfully, well, geez, suffering. Oops. Right? So I always like to say how people handle their business is on them. How we handle how people handle their business 
is on us. That's ours. So, amazingly, unusually for me, I'm right on time for us to jump into some sitting and we can work on handling some of this business of ours. Okay. I always like to advise that if you are in a seated position, you can have your hips elevated higher than your knees if possible, which is good for your posture as well as your breathing. And if that's not possible right now, not a huge problem, something to keep in mind for the future perhaps. And let's begin as we always do by imagining that we are suspended from the ceiling by a piece of string attached to the tops of our heads as a nice cue to sit up straight without adding any extra tension to do so. If there is some tension here, we don't need to try to get rid of it, because usually that means, well, we're trying to force it away, which involves bringing more tension to the tension that's already here. So that doesn't really work. What we can do is consider any tension that might be here one of those loose ends. Something maybe unresolved that we don't have to tie up and resolve right now. We can simply allow whatever is here, including tension, if it's here, to be here. If there is a lack of tension here, well, we can allow a lack of tension to be here. So let's take a moment and simply notice what we've brought here with us today. Then you may notice them as loose ends. If there are things that feel unresolved, unpleasant, less than ideal. And maybe just let them be loose ends for a moment. And if you haven't already, you may begin to bring your attention to your breathing. And the same way we don't have to interfere with any tension that may be here, we don't have to interfere with the breathing either. There's no meditative breath we need to achieve. Our meditative breath is the breath we have while we are meditating, simply paying attention to it. If you find that the breathing is not the way you think it should be, you certainly can try to change it. There's nothing wrong with that. You may also simply let it be as it is. And notice that as a loose end. What 
what comes up. When we let a loose end be a loose end. When we let something less than ideal be less than ideal. What does the mind do? Can we make space for that? And just listen. As I mentioned, there are lots of very basic, simple aspects to the practice. That scale. So the same way that the techniques the principles that I used in the very minor examples I offered scale to just about anything, really. The way we work with even just the breathing also scales. And here's what I mean. One of the reasons we work with the breathing so much in the practice is because it's the central meeting point of what's called in Buddhism all of our fabrications, bodily fabrication, verbal fabrication, mental fabrication. In English, (laughs) what this means is our bodily activity and our felt and perceived experience of it as well as our directed thought are all involved. We're paying attention to the breathing. We're evaluating how well we're paying attention to the breathing. We're noticing how it feels. We're noticing the various bodily sensations. And how these factors all interact with each other. For example, like I say, I don't try to force tension away because I find that doesn't work. If I simply allow tension to be tension, well, it'll leave in its own time. That's more effective. So there's a lot of 
noticing of bodily sensations and directing thought, my intention. Well, these are all the same processes that interact with each other when we're writing these selfing storylines I'm talking about. Somebody does something that we think is out of line. It's all the same components that start getting geared up, right? There's the directed thought as we work through what they've said or done and the feelings that come up around it and then the bodily response that comes up around that and that kicks off more thinking and well, there's your cycle. There's your cycle of rumination, your cycle of suffering. And the way I've found most success working with that, as I described today, was, well, let's just watch it and see what's going on here, rather than perpetuating the shitstorm. Well, what are we doing here in the practice with the breathing? Huh, we're watching it, huh? Watching the body, watching the mind, watching the feelings. If we get good at that with the breathing, that doesn't happen in a vacuum. That means we get better at watching the mind, the body, the feelings. Off the cushion, out in the world. That's why I was able to catch myself in these real-life situations. So it's enough to just sit with the breathing. Notice it physically, what comes up around it in a felt sense. Notice our directed thought and intention to stay with the breathing. And sometimes I even get a mental image of those loose ends, like fringe, just flowing in the breeze, surrounded by the breathing. And they can flap and they can flail. And I can just watch them.
if you find that you have started following a mental thread, started following a loose end down a rabbit hole, I invite you to just cut it short right wherever it is. Let's come back to the breather. Mid-thought, mid-sentence, whatever it was, wherever you were, guaranteed it'll, it'll be there for you again. In fact, if anything, it's probably going to keep knocking. You're not going to have to go looking for it. It's going to come looking for you, right? So what happens if we just cut it short as soon as we notice? Say, up. Oh, no, I don't have to follow that to a logical conclusion right now. In fact, there's more to be gained by seeing what happens in the mind, in the body, in the feelings. If I don't. What happens when I handle this differently? And just breathe with that. One other metaphor, visualization, that I'll briefly offer, in case it resonates for anyone. Being the type A personality that I am, there's some selfing there for you. Uh... I have a tendency to always want to get things off the plate, right? Get things done, not have anything hanging over me. And the way that I've come to visualize that is when I feel like I've got something on the plate, I feel like there's this, what I call mental pressure. I get this mental image of like my mind as a physical object. And somebody just taking their finger and pushing gently, but just pushing enough to notice, enough to be annoying, right? On one part of my mind. And I want to get rid of that pressure. And of course, we run into the cycle of, okay, you know, I got to do that to get rid of that pressure, and I got to do that to get rid of that pressure, and we just get on the hamster wheel and never stop to say, well, wait a minute, let me investigate this pressure. The hell is this anyway?
I'm the one creating the pressure. <laughs> Doesn't feel like it, but it's me. So again, causing my own suffering. So, instead of doing my suffering's bidding and creating more suffering, how about checking out the process behind it? Maybe unravel the damn thing a little. And that's the same sort of thing I feel in these situations, like I was describing with the loose ends. And it's another way of saying a loose end is feeling like this mental pressure, like someone's pressing on my mind. And we can bring our attention to something like that and say, well, wait a minute, what's this actually like? Rather than taking the shoot first, ask questions later approach and just trying to get rid of it at any cost as fast as possible. Again, that's trying not to feel something. What if we just feel the damn thing? Actually check it out for a minute. No, what the hell is this? Can I breathe with it? I see what it does. Can I see what it does when I don't try to do anything to it, for it, about it? I'll close the sitting with a quote from Tanisaru Bhikkhu, as I mentioned I might. When the Buddha taught breath meditation, one of the perceptions he taught was to make your mind like space. Space, he says, doesn't have a surface. Nothing can be written on it. So try to create as few problems as possible for yourself by making your mind the kind of mind that nobody can write anything on. Keep that perception of space. Whatever they do, it's like writing on space. There's nothing there to write on, so you don't keep anything. Our problem is that we tend to be like people who are engraving things in stone. Something happens we don't like, and it gets engraved in the mind, as if it's never going to be washed away. Of course, that becomes a burden. The stone itself is a burden, and the engraving is a burden. So it's good to learn how to put those things down, to let them go, to have that mind-like space. And I'm going to read one other short one. Because I came across so many quotes that were good for today's sitting. And I want to include this one also. If there's suffering, the cause is not outside. Just turn around and look in your mind. This is not for the purpose of laying the blame on you. It's for the purpose of offering you a path out of the suffering. What people do outside often is totally outrageous. Sometimes people don't even behave like people. They behave like beasts. And it's true. We're not denying that fact. 
But if you focus on them, that's not going to solve the problem. We're not here to assign who's to blame and who's not to blame for your suffering. We're here to find a way out. And the way out is by looking into the mind. How do you shape things? When you go about looking and listening, thinking, what are you looking for? Can you look and listen in a different way? When you frame things in this way, it's really empowering. Thank you, everyone. I will put a few links into the chat, and then we'll get to some Q&A. The first link there is to my website. These free sessions are supported by one-on-one sessions that I do with folks. Anyone who's interested in diving in a little bit deeper with something you might be going through right now, these practices that have been helping so many people for 2,500 years now, of which I am just one in a one drop in a huge bucket. If anyone would like to set something up or inquire about that, the first link is to my website, mindfulnessandbluejeans.com. I have the link to that YouTube page I was mentioning earlier. My YouTube channel's up there. Feel free to leave a nasty comment. I'll use it for my practice. And uh, I have my Patreon and Venmo up there as well for anyone who would like to help support these directly. And I think we're going to move on to my favorite part of these, which is hearing what's on your mind. Anyone who has any questions, thoughts, observations? Uh, Hi, Jeanette. Yes. Um, I'll try to state this clearly. (laughs) Sure. So, In terms of your two examples, I also got the sense that you felt that, and I'm also um, using my experiences. So I might be speaking more about myself than you, but that you were being disrespected. Yeah. Uh, Is that true? Okay. Yeah, I would say that's fair. Yeah. Okay. And I have definitely, actually, I'm experiencing that at the moment with this particular person. And I totally understand that you're saying you cannot control this, anybody else. But what about speaking your truth? I mean, in terms of saying, speaking your truth or feeling disrespected, whether it was the so what, what they was written on the website or this fellow at dinner and going from there. That feels more genuine to me, but I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Sure. It's a great question. So in a, I'll answer it generally and specifically. Generally speaking, yeah, this comes under the, you know, when I mentioned it's not that we don't act, it's that when we do act, we're doing it from a better place. So It's not that we don't respond to transgressions necessarily. It's that we're we're doing it more skillfully and and more wisely based on our clearer seeing of the situation that we're developing. In my particular situations, I would say and it's interesting that you asked, I'm I'm actually reviewing this in my mind as I as I say. I I don't have a uh, I don't have a canned answer for this. This sure. is I'm working through it. So this is I, I appreciate the question because this is you're asking me something I really hadn't asked myself. Huh. So thank you for that. Okay. Um I would say in the instance of the first example, there are really two things at play, I would say. Thing number one was I have certainly learned enough times in my life that the way I perceive things is not necessarily the way things are. Mm. And the because I, as I mentioned, these were folks that we had really just met. We'd only seen them once before, and that was in a, a large gathering. So this was the first time that we'd been with them, just us. So we really didn't know these people very well yet. And I frankly didn't know if, A, I 
perceived this response that I received accurately. And secondly, I really didn't know what the person who offered it was, what their personality was really like yet. So while I perceived it as something that was rude, I wasn't sure that it was really offered that way. And I felt like, well, let's let's just roll with this. And if this is what this person's really like, then there's no need to continue to try to continue to build a friendship here. And um, and if it if not, then no worries. Um, we're extremely good friends now. <laughs> um, so and that sort of thing never really happened again. So rolling with it in retrospect seems to have been just fine. I think uh, I think I would have created a mountain out of a, a molehill and maybe a molehill that never really existed. So, but also coupled with that was the fact that, like I mentioned when I was talking about it, once I had this insight, because the whole process I described really took, I don't know, maybe 90 seconds or so. And I just let the other folks at the table talk as it was happening. I just kind of stayed back and checked in with myself for a minute. Once that sense of self that I mentioned when it fell away, and I no longer felt that threat, I didn't feel the need to say anything about it. There was just no need. And I think that really ties in with the second instance, which is another way of saying, you know, you don't have to follow every loose end. Here's somebody who posted something on a YouTube channel Frankly, the spelling and grammar were all over the road and the person was saying things that were extremely hypocritical. And I'm looking at this and I'm just like, is this worth my time? And it, it really came under the category of we don't have to accept every invitation to a fight that we receive. And I kind of looked at this and I made a value call. It's like, I think my time could be better spent elsewhere. In fact, if anything, I've already ruminated and storylined on this enough, gained or regained some insight from it, feel the sense of gratitude to my unexpected teacher here. And uh, I'm good. I can, um, I can just delete this thing and... Go read some more Tanisaru Biku or something, you know? So that's pretty much how they played out. So do you have like a, this is the wrong word, but I'll say a criteria in terms of when you decide it is worth speaking up and when it is, let this kind of slide? Yeah, great question. I would I would classify this as one of those things where we're always trying to have a playbook for life and try and figure out what's always going to be the right response or the right reaction or the right thing to do in every situation. And we don't have that. We won't have that. We can't have that. And that's why we practice regularly is so that when things do come up, when unexpected things come up, as they always will, we can't be ready for every scenario we can more and more quickly discern more and more skillfully what the right reaction and response will be in each given situation. So do I have criteria? No, no. And it wouldn't matter if I did because I would never cover everything and I would spend all my time trying to come up with, with those criteria. So as my first teacher likes to say, the map is not the territory. The map is not the terrain. We're on the terrain. And the map is not gonna it's not gonna have every pitfall on it. So what we want to hone is our ability to see clearly so that as we are traversing the actual terrain, we can do it more and more skillfully based on having our eyes open rather than having them fixed on the how to do it manual. So the ability to see more and more clearly just I would sounds like it almost innately becomes a knowing of what action you do or don't take. It does. 
coupled with the ongoing experience of how it works out each time you do it. That's what mindfulness is about. So one of the misconceptions about mindfulness is that mindfulness is, is about, it means awareness. In Western society these days, mindfulness is the flavor of the month. That's the flavor it's taken on. Oh, it's awareness. No, awareness is awareness. When the Buddha taught mindfulness, it's a function of memory. It's keeping in mind what has been skillful in the past. And this is a perfect example of that. As we are engaging in our experimentation, trying something different, we're seeing how things work out and we're fine. Oh, okay. This worked. That didn't work. Let me change this. And that's how our skillfulness gets built based on that experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. And thanks for making me think about that. Sure. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Anyone else like to jump in? Hey, Amy. Hi, really just quickly, please. I sometimes wonder, like, is this all sinking in? Am I able to translate this to my life? You know, and it's just kind of in the back of my mind. And the other day, my partner and I started going down a real rabbit hole of worry and concern, like about one of the kids. And what if this? And what if that? And, and then I just stopped and I go, is this skillful? <laughs> and I couldn't believe it came out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> because I, you know, when it's, I think, apart from my own internal stuff, I can be a little bit more um, helpful and like, is this skillful? No, it's not. And we just kind of drop them. And thank you, because I would never have been able to um, come to that and hold that raft and float away from the issue without just this. No, thank you. Thank you. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, I and and I that deeply resonates because uh, for anyone who can't, if you can't tell on uh, if you can't tell on Zoom, if you, you see my nose, I'm Jewish by birth, <laughs> Buddhist by practice, Jewish by birth, and so raised by a Jewish mother. I'm the king of what if, what if, what if, what if, and it even um, even doubles back on itself in terms of this not uh, following every thread or, or loose ends and so forth. Because one of the first things that comes up for me when I don't follow each thread is what if I don't follow the thread? You know, what if I don't engage in what if? It's another one of those cycles that doubles back on itself and compounds itself. What if I'm not what ifing? I have to what if, otherwise I won't get this done and I won't. I have to what if. What if I don't what if? And um, that's what you did. That's what you did. You were like, do I have to what if? Maybe I don't have to what if. What if I don't what if? Oh, wow. If I don't what if, it just falls away. And why does it fall away? Well, it falls away because you're not. What ifing? <laughs> Where are the ones perpetuating the cycle? And that's what you saw. You you had a you had a fantastic insight. Yeah. Miracles happen. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's and it's not a miracle. It's not a miracle. It's because you've been work I mean you've I I know you've been part of my sessions for what, three years at least? It's been a while. Yeah. yeah. Coming up on it, I think. And this gets back to what I was saying to Jeanette, which is it's this, it's the regularity of practice. It's the persistence. It's the consistency. You didn't open up a rule book that said, oh, is this one I say, is this skillful? It just popped out. Right. And it popped out because, well, you've been practicing it. I'm also the person who has to let go of that idea that there is a rule book. Because hmm? I still want a rule book, even though I know that. Me too. That wouldn't help me. Oh, me too. I have to let that go because I'm having a hard time letting that go. <laughs> I don't just still want one. I still try to write them. <laughs> and then and then I have to catch myself and say, is this skillful? Because <laughs> how many times has life shown me that it uh, – I mean, you're, you're perfectly welcome to write as much as you want, but wait till you see this other shit I got in store for you. <laughs> right. What was the old thing? Life is what happens while you're busy making other plans. 
it doesn't matter what script you write. Life will find a way around that thing and fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I'm really happy to hear you had that experience. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. But I'm very happy to hear that. Thank you for sharing that. Cheers. Hey, Ron. Hey, Barbara. How's it going? Hey, let me find myself. Hold on. I'm trying to find myself. We're, right. we're all trying to find ourselves, Always Barbara. To... <laughs> Correct. I just wanted to say a quick hello. It's Hi. Been a while. And um, I'm just in awe of your generosity for offering yourself to us for free, even. <laughs> so um, thank you for that. And I haven't thought about you. I'm sorry. I don't take it personally. <laughs> it's not required. Oh, good. I try not to think about me. <laughs> and, I know what you mean on that. And then at 5 to 11 this morning, you came in strongly. Ron, I wonder if he's doing a thing today. Oh, yeah. And I found you after some difficulty online with Meetup, but that's another story. Um, I did find you, and I'm glad I did. And so keep up the good work, my friend. Love you. Cheers. Much love. Thank you. Thank you. Um. I wasn't going to mention this, but I will because of what you just said and how, how well it dovetails with what Jeanette asked. One of the things that that YouTuber put on my thing was that it was really bizarre. One, of, I'm going to guess it's a... I'm just going to say he. I'm going to guess it was a he. I don't know. One of the things that he wasn't apparently thrilled with was the session that he commented on was called um, handling the world's chaos. And he said something about what is this stuff about chaos? Meditation is just about love. My meditation practice is all just about love. What, what's, what's this chaos stuff? And then he says, it's only supposed to be about love. You're only interested in money. That's a bizarre thing to post on a free YouTube channel. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't do, I don't have advertise. I mean, there's nothing. I mean, it's, you know, there's like dozens of sessions up on a free YouTube channel <laughs> coming from free meetups and free insight timer sessions. I do. And I'm just like, where the hell did that even come from? And again, I wasn't even going to mention it. And the only reason I, I am mentioning is because of what you just said about, you know, and that was where this feeling of disrespect, right, comes in that Jeanette was asking about was like, well, who the hell are you? <laughs> and uh, that was one of those things where it's like, well, yeah, there's all these sorts of storylines come up about well geez i could say this and i could say that and i could do this and i do that and who the fuck is this the fuck the fuck for you right and 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 all this sort of you know this is the sort of stuff that comes up and it was in that moment that i remembered again that's a session that i did on insight timer for free <laughs> that i did on insight timer like a month ago about the um about the loose ends and suddenly i just saw and again, I didn't have a rule book. I wasn't like, this is when you think about the loose end. It just came up because it was something I'd been practicing. Oh, and suddenly I saw this as a loose end that I was trying to think up all these ways to bring to a satisfactory resolution. And I was like, well, wait, do I have to? Oh, geez. No, I don't. Oh, what if I don't? Well, then I guess I have time for something else. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> Let me go do something else. And that was pretty much the end of that. So, a little more of a peek behind the curtain, <laughs> which I'm always happy to do. My, my curtain is transparent. Okay. Always feel free to drop me a line if you like. If there's something you wanted to cover or ask that you didn't want to do here. And have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks so much for being with me. It's great to see you all. Thank you, Ron. Cheers. Take, Take care, care, everyone. Bye. I know. <laughs>